Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Um, as a former Winnipegger, I was greatly amused the other day to wake up in the morning and hear on the news that uh, the emergency services has started this, you know, extreme weather shelter. I mean, being out, outside and trying to live on the street is, is terrible wherever you are, but for Winnipeg to, to call this weather extreme, although I know from Victorians this is extreme. So thank you for braving this extreme weather. I know some of you are worried, uh, but you'll be okay. So uh, my name is Paul Brown, and I'm the director of the Center for Studies in Religion and Society. And uh, along with a number of my colleagues here, uh, I'm part of a uh, project called the City Talks series. Um, we've had now, this is the third talk on religion in the city, and our fourth talk, which was going to be December 2nd, is actually now postponed until April 10th, oh. so stay tuned for that. And the City Talk series will continue, though, in, in uh, January, uh, and the focus will shift from religion in the city to security in the city. Um, so religion in the city, security in the city, and then we end with religion in the city in, in April. So thank you for joining us this evening. Um, the speaker this evening is Meyerson Atiki, who is a professor of politics at Meyerson University, where he was founding director of the graduate program in immigration and settlement studies. He's currently the Jack Layton chair at Ryerson, a position he created, that was created after Layton's death and intended to advance the legacy of political and human, humanitarian uh, leadership that Jack was so famous for. And in Jack's honor, I actually wore my special Jack Layton sweater. So, hey. Um, Meyer is a frequent uh, media commentator on political matters. His career achievements are many, but I'll just to give you a few of them. He was awarded the Distinguished Educator Award at Ryerson, uh, Ryerson Popular Professor Citation for McLean's uh, Guide. Um, he was the research domain leader at the Center of Excellence for Research and Immigration and Settlement, which is part of the Metropolis Project, many of you know about. And he's been active in the Ryerson community for many years. He has contributed to organizing such campus events as the Ryerson Union Fair and the Ryerson Holocaust Education Program. Meyer's research has explored diverse dimensions in, of immigrant inclusion and exclusion in cities. His publications have ranged quite widely from labor studies to urban studies and immigration studies, including an interest in religion and public space in the city. Among other things, he has examined how cities have responded to faith-based public space claims made by Muslims and Jews. I'm pleased also that Meyer is a friend of mine. We've known each other for, I don't know, about 10 years through the Metropolis. And um, we managed with uh, three or four other people uh, at uh, a restaurant to get through an entire meal without saying, oh, four. Uh, <laughs> so in case you weren't planning to say it, I just said it. Because I know as a Toronto scholar and an urbanist, it's going to be hard uh, not to mention him. So it, it has been mentioned. So you can now just skip them all together if you want. Made the meal additionally pleasurable. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Meyer is going kind of old school. He's simply going to talk to you. He's actually not going to use PowerPoint, which I think is going to be a nice change. And uh, what, what we'll do is he'll talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have maybe about the same amount of time for some conversation afterwards, which I will moderate. So, please join me in welcoming Meyer Thank you, Paul, for generous introduction and uh, to the urban studies group uh, here at uh, the University of Victoria for this invitation. I've been looking forward to this a long time. Uh, it has been an occasion for me to think about some new questions about religion and the city that I've uh, spent some time over the last couple of months reading about and researching. I was saying to Paul, um, I think there's a very good question at the core of what I wanted to explore tonight. I'm not sure there's a very good answer uh, that's yet in my findings. So I'm very much looking forward to sharing with you the path that I've been on the last, uh, uh, the last couple of months and the research that I've been doing, and very much to get, your, uh, uh, to get interested in getting your feedback and your thoughts. It's very nice to have uh, a couple of uh, Ryersonians, or ex Ryersonian in the case of Warren in the room, and uh, actually a, a, a one-time uh, dean and boss of mine, Mark Lovewell. Nice surprise to have you here, Mark. So uh, uh, first time I've ever spoken in a uh, public space like this. Uh, so this is just a lovely, lovely venue and, uh, and, and opportunity. Um, and boy, is it good to get away from Toronto these days. <laughs> uh, you, you have heard of Mr. Ford, I have. Um, 
I have wondered how the, all this uh, uh, news overdose about uh, our mayor is playing outside of Toronto. And, and it's sort of a question like, is it one more dose of, can they ever stop thinking of themselves uh, in downtown Toronto and foisting it on the rest of the world? Or, oh, please tell us more about how really crazed you are down there. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I quite wonder what the, uh, what the take in the rest of Toronto is on our mayor. Uh, I can assure you we are completely befuddled ourselves and uh, um, uh, difficult to make, uh, difficult to make any sense of. Uh, this is such a terrific um, lecture series that uh, the folks at UVic have put on the City Talks uh, series. I was saying to them over over dinner, and I mean this very sincerely. I can't think of a higher quality, better, ongoing lecture series and public discussion engagement of cities, their issues, their challenges, their prospects, then what has gone on here at UVic, it, uh, I gather, often in this space, uh, through the City Talk series. It's just a really creative and important dialogue that you are uh, launching here. Uh, you know, my talk is, is, is titled The City in the Religious Imagination. Uh, my sense is that, that as Canadians generally, we don't put a lot of imaginary stock in our self-understanding as a highly hyper-urban country. We don't often enough think about Canada in an ur through an urban lens and an urban uh, dimension. Um, we know that Canada is way ahead of the curve of the rest of the world in terms of rates of, human, of uh, urbanization. Uh, there was a lot of fanfare a few years ago when uh, the UN announced, as best as they could count, that uh, we had passed for the first time ever in human history the 50% threshold of people living, living in cities as urban. Uh, Canada's rate is at 80%, 70% of Canadians live in a census metropolitan area like Victoria. And uh, I still think an amazing one-third of all Canadians live in our top three uh, urban metropolitan centres. Uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find any other countries in the world that have that high a threshold of, of uh, urban concentration and urbanization. And yet for a whole variety of reasons, some geographic, some constitutional, some political, uh, some um, uh, just perhaps the limits of our uh, ability to self-define in our geographic and natural setting, uh, we don't often th enough think of ourselves as an urban country and an urban population. And good on you, Vic, and this series for for um, for focusing on uh, the city in this lecture series. And I especially like that, of course, that this semester you have picked as your theme religion and the city. Um, I can't necessarily uh, claim that this is a prophetic choice on your part, but it is a very timely choice on your part. Uh, the academics in the room will know that there is more and more talk of the modern contemporary city in the Western world, in the global north, being the post-secular city. So this, this concept and discourse of post-secular cities situates and, and, and understands cities as no longer, as many used to think, uh, definitively secular civil societies, places where a secular logic, a secular understanding, a secular value system was supreme. And we have had the return of religion in a very significant uh, uh, way in, in uh, uh, many cities, particularly city, cities, of the, cities of the global north, often uh, 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 not exclusively, but in part brought about by forces and dynamics of global migration. So there's an increasing recognition that cities are places where the spiritual, the religious, the secular, the humanist, all intersect and somehow have to negotiate and sort out a being together in shared space. Um, I imagine that many of you, as I say those words, cast your minds a bit further east to the province of Quebec, and this is playing out politically in such interesting and, and, and uh, challenging ways. But we are now in cities where more and more, and this is what I'll go on to say, has has been a major recent uh, uh, interest of mine is 
Uh, how do claims on public space get made from a religious perspective and a religious vantage point? And how does civil society and civic government respond to those respond to those claims? So that's that's much of the work that I have done related to religion and the city in the past. It's kind of looked at. Uh, the response, the orientation by civil society and city governments to claims on the basis of religion. In a way, when I, when, I, when I received this lovely invitation, I thought, well, option one is kind of share some of the findings of the work that I've done in the past. And the riskier road I took was to think, gee, maybe this is an opportunity to flip that that the lens around in the kind of research I've done. Instead of asking how do civic institutions respond to religion, maybe I should ask the question, how do religious texts and tradition regard and imagine and construct the city? What, how how does, does religion as a faith system, as a, <coughs> a, a series of beliefs and understanding, what do religions think of cities? Uh, so that's the bulk of what I'll be uh, presenting uh, presenting today, and um, because this is rather new ground for me, I thought I'd be safer working from uh, uh, text, uh, and so I, I have written written my remarks. Part of this also was to try to stay within a reasonable uh, uh, allotment uh, of time. Um, so uh, it's at this point that if I can find my place, I'll shift to my uh, written remarks and, and uh, go from there and, and uh, uh, try to read them with as much uh, gusto and uh, um, energy as I can uh, to, keep, uh, uh, to keep the focus on uh, the arguments and comments that I'm making. But first, I do need to try to, uh, uh, to, try, to, find my, uh, uh, to try to find my place. Uh, maybe, maybe one place to start. But there's something interesting here that I hadn't uh, that I hadn't picked up on. Um, uh, is to start by. Uh, whoops, bear with me just a moment. Here. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so let me start, I'll pick it up for perhaps a biographical uh, entry point. Um, I suspect that my own scholarly uh, engagement with religion and the city uh, was planted early on in the streets where I grew up in Montreal. Uh, growing up in mid-20th century Montreal as the child of recently arrived Jewish immigrants, some of my most vivid early memories relate to experiencing Jewish life in the city's public space. These included the huge throngs of people on the streets during religious holidays, the great variety of buildings serving as places of worship, here a magisterial synagogue structure, and there some modest nondescript row house serving the same place of worship purpose. Then there were uh, the sounds uh, of Yiddish spoken throughout the neighborhood, signaling another solitude added to Montreal's distinct mid-century demographic. Subconsciously, I suspect, these childhood experiences led me relatively late in my academic career, that means about eight or nine years ago, uh, to conjure up an interest in religion and public civil, uh, civic space. In a sense, then, I kind of think of myself now as a post-secular scholar. Uh, I used to uh, 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 labor in the secular soil of scholarship uh, uh, in, in much of my research. And, and uh, I've now found religion myself as an academic source of study in the same way as post-secular uh, uh, post city literature now draws to our attention the way in which cities have uh, reacquired and, and, and uh, uh, regained a, a, a dynamic uh, religious uh, religious pr uh, presence. Uh, what got me going was realizing that religious identity was a major dynamic behind a lot of political issues that interested me. In a city like Toronto, 
It dawned on me about a decade ago that religion was often the prompt and the platform behind immigrant and minority civic engagement, community mobilization, and claims to rights in the city and belonging in their new urban home. It led me to write in one article, and this is the only time I will quote myself, but just, just to kind of argue uh, 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 the way I see things now, that religion is increasingly becoming the terrain on which the spatial inclusion of immigrants and minorities in Canada is being contested. That whether there is belonging, whether there is integration, uh, is, is increasingly, for a number of, of uh, newcomer communities, measured in terms of their religious experiences, their religious aspirations. And generally speaking, frictions have uh, uh, arisen uh, related to religion and the public sphere in at least three distinct kinds of uh, 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 areas. One has to do with religious uh, garments and artifacts. What can be worn where and when and by whom? That's significantly what is playing out uh, uh, in Quebec. A second, which is the one that I devoted most of my uh, uh, attention to, was the issue of building places of worship. Uh, where could religious uh, uh, prayer houses be built? And this inevitably brought faith communities into contact with municipal governments and with municipal zoning uh, provisions. It certainly brought them into contact with neighbors uh, who may not have been enthused about the prospect of a new uh, place of worship arising in their, in, in, in their neighborhood. Uh, and thirdly, of course, uh, this is especially the case in Ontario, there have been conflict over uh, religious school funding. So the funding of religious education, the establishment or expansion of places of worship, and the wearing of uh, religious garments, artifacts in public space have obviously become flashpoints of uh, issues of integration, issues of belonging, issues of how do we understand ourselves as a collective and, and uh, as a society. So as I've said, most of my own research to this point was in that second area, exploring conflicts related to constructing religious space in the city. Cities are religious landscapes, places of worship, burial, dietary compliance requirements around restaurants and where they are located, all of these institutional physical uh, uh, structures in the city can define urban streets and urban neighborhoods. And you'll get a first-hand look at that this Saturday, as I understand. There will be a walking tour of uh, uh, post-secular Victoria uh, by uh, um, very clever graduate student who's put together that walk, and you'll be able to actually see uh, the presence of religious space and faith and institutions in the city and, and uh, how they contribute to giving definition to the city. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I won't be here for that, uh, for that tour myself. So uh, uh, as, as Paul mentioned previously, I've written about the challenges that both Muslims and Orthodox Jews have had in printing their religious identity on urban landscapes. One study with a colleague, who some of you may know, Amy Eisen, looked at resistance in Toronto to building mosques. It examined four instances in four different Toronto area municipalities where local councils stymied efforts by Muslim congregations to either establish or expand a mosque. In all these cases, it turned out the mosque ultimately did get approved, typically with some requirements for reduced uh, size or reduced uh, 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 um, um, uh, numbers who could uh, use the facility. But interestingly, in three of those four instances, the approval came not from elected local council, but from a provincially appointed planning review body established in Ontario that had the power to make the final decision. So these were interesting dynamics where, apart from other things that were going on, the elected politicians would not support a, cl a, a, a claim a, 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 a on space from a, a, a minority faith community. Uh, it was uh, uh, a decision-making body that is often attacked as undemocratic, which it is, as unaccountable, which it is. It was that institution uh, rather than the elected officials who made the decision to uh, support the faith-based needs of, uh, of uh, minority communities. I'll just tell you what one I thought very interesting historical uh, uh, 
parallel that one of the uh, adjudicators drew was um, in 19th century uh, Ontario, a lot of land got, got uh, allocated as clergy, clergy reserves to uh, enable the construction of churches. And this adjudicator, very interestingly, at the end of the 20th century uh, uh, ruled that if um, uh, Protestant churches could get all of this land given to them by the state, uh, maybe there was some onus on the state to also show some flexibility to uh, more recent faith communities in terms of uh, their, uh, uh, their needs. Uh, I want, one of the things that, that was, was very powerful to me in this work, which I'm not sure I fully appreciated, and I, I want to share with you a couple of uh, quotes from some of the participants. Some of these were like uh, uh, um, uh, these attempts to build mosques in Toronto um, resulted in raucous, loud, uh, uh, angry public meetings uh, uh, of uh, a community wanting something and, and residents uh, often being, uh, being, being speaking out in, in opposition. Uh, I want to let you hear some of the voices that were articulated around this, just to give you a sense of how charged and significant the issue of faith and faith-based institutions in urban landscapes uh, uh, can be. Um, so if I, again, can find my place here. Um, here is a quote from um, uh, a resident who was opposed to, uh, oh boy, I really am having difficulty finding some of my, uh, uh, my places here. Bear with me in this light. Okay. Uh, so here, here, here's one statement of opposition to, build, to building a mosque in uh, pretty much sort of central city Toronto. Uh, the individual says, uh, there is no comparison to this kind of building here in Canada. It was going to be a foreign exotic building. We feel we don't want to see a minaret or dome in the neighborhood. If they put up this minaret and dome, it will act like a calling card for the whole community. So one can imagine some of the anxieties about neighborhood transformation, about uh, 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 property values, about uh, 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 newcomers into the community who may or may not be, be fully welcome. Um, after the, uh, in this instance, it's the Ontario Municipal Board, this appointed body approved it. Uh, someone who had initially opposed uh, uh, the structure, I thought, said something very lovely in, in, in a commentary a a afterward where he said, although he had opposed the <clears throat> construction of the mosque, uh, he had to concede that it was a beautiful structure, that it brought to the street a different cultural idiom, and uh, that uh, it was completely crossing cultural lines from the historic simple Protestant idiom to the exotic romantic Eastern design. And he thought this was a lovely new addition to the physical landscape of, of the city. And it kind of got me thinking that sometimes, sometimes cities open themselves up to the world one building at a time by reimagining and rethinking what the significance of a particular structure is and what it can mean in a particular landscape. Uh, more, most powerful yet was the, the message that uh, one of the leaders of the mosque took from this, and so this is a quote from um, this is a quote from one of uh, uh, the mosque's leaders who said, "The erection of the dome and minaret would signal that the city of York." This was in one of the boroughs of Toronto, now amalgamated with Toronto. Uh, the erection of the dome and minaret would signal that the city of York is a tolerant multicultural place, a place where all, where all are welcome to live and contribute to the cultural and economic life of the region. So certainly from the vantage point of newcomer <coughs> communities and minority faith communities, uh, a recognition of their legitimate uh, claims on public space uh, becomes illustrative and becomes almost a kind of marker of whether they are accepted as Canadians or not accepted as, as Canadians and their place within, uh, uh, within the country. So lo and behold, there was a lot about uh, uh, political participation, mobilization, lobbying, almost a sense of urban citizenship. If we are of this city, what claims can we make and what rights can we expect to have 
in the city that uh, in the city that we call home. Uh, in the interest of time, I think I'll pass over the very interesting uh, case of uh, uh, the Orthodox, uh, the Orthodox Jewish community, uh, uh, or, or, or I'll give it much shorter shrift. Uh, uh, this relates to the uh, requirement of Orthodox Jews around the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, Orthodox Jews are uh, not are um, um, uh, are not to work. Uh, and this then uh, requires them to have definitions of what constitutes work. And one of the biblical injunctions and definitions around work is carrying. If you carry something outside of the home, you are deemed, this is how broad the interpretation of the holy text has, uh, has become over time. To carry something outside of the home is to engage in work. Uh, if that's the case, it would be very difficult to leave the home and actually go to prayer services on the Sabbath. Uh, if you wanted to carry your keys with you uh, um, uh, so that you could lock the door behind you, uh, you know, by, by, by strict definition of what can, that is carrying, that would be, there would be a prohibition on that. So uh, uh, a, a very uh, difficult and problematic and rigid, perhaps, definition of a, of, a, of a prohibition has been established. So now Orthodox Jewry needs to find a way to uh, make observance of prayer outside of the home compatible with the need inevitably to carry some things, whether it's keys in your pockets or whether it's to push a baby buggy and stroller, whether it's to carry an umbrella. Uh, how is this to be done? Well, this is done through the uh, uh, pr institution of a very interesting religious phenomenon in Orthodox Jewry called an Eruv, E-R-U-V. It is, uh, the way out of this dilemma is if you could deem public space to be private for religious purposes of observance to be an extension of the home, then you can carry anything. Okay, so the trick is, how do you get to define public space as an extension of the private realm? The answer is, you construct an air roof. So we're very much in the realm of almost virtual space, fantasized physical bound, uh, boundaries. And uh, the key thing to constructing an air roof is, it must be a totally enclosed, it must be totally enclosed and, and, and separate as, uh, as space. And so one of the things you then have to do is string virtually invisible wire on utility poles to, uh, to enclose this space. Who says you can string things on, on municipal utility poles? Uh, so that, of course, is uh, the latitude of uh, the city and city governments. And there have been any number of massive, major knockdown, drag down battles, not just in the, the, uh, uh, the highest profile one in, uh, in uh, Canada was in Outremont uh, uh, on the island of Montreal, part of the city of Montreal. These have flared up in the United States. These have flared up in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in Britain. And in, in the cases that I looked at uh, for a special issue of the journal that Paul, that Paul edited, the interesting thing was, again, in each case, the Orthodox Jews were given uh, 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 the okay to uh, construct these uh, an eruv, but they got that permission in the courts, not from elected politicians. There was a huge amount of public backlash, and the backlash was a perception that here was a defined religious minority that somehow wanted to appropriate public space kind of exclusively for their purposes. So even there, though there was something almost fantastical about this exercise to begin with as a sort of imaginary conjured way of if we can all just accept that this is an extension of our home, we can all go to synagogue on the Sabbath. If we can't convince ourselves of that, we can't leave the house. So this becomes extremely significant for the believers, but for the secular society around them, it kind of smacks of, gee, a, a special privilege that some minority group wants to define <laughs> civic space as theirs. Okay, so these are all really interesting and, and, and uh, 
uh, uh, uh, complex uh, uh, um, differences over public space, uh, they remind me of two quotes in the literature on cities and land use. One is from uh, Leonie Sandercock, who you've heard from in a previous lecture. Leonie Sandercock says, uh, because I think th these battles over religious claims on public space are exemplars of Leonie Sandercock's comment that uh, who belongs where and with what rights in our global cities is a pressing question that all uh, Western cities are now are now having to having to deal with. And uh, the Australian um, urbanist, I think she's either an anthropologist or geographer. Uh, I'm giving you this elongated um, uh, bio on her because her name happens to be Jane Jacobs, but it's not the Jane Jacobs. Yet. Can you imagine that? Being an urban scholar whose name just happens to be Jane. <laughs> this, is, this, this is tough. Uh, this may explain why she inserts the initial M between the Jane and the Jacobs. Uh, and she is a very fine, she is a very fine scholar. Uh, uh, you know, Jane Jacobs refers to the complicated politics of the production of urban space. This is what we're getting into. Uh, uh, this is what we are experiencing in more and more cities around claims from, from, religious, uh, uh, from religious faith communities. Okay. So having done these studies of how public institutions, governments, courts respond to religious claims, I then wanted to turn this on its head and say, okay, now how do religions see the city? Okay. And my plan initially was to look at the Abrahamic uh, uh, religions of uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and to look at their sacred texts. And what could I learn from, their, from these sacred texts? about uh, uh, depictions, imaginations, constructions of uh, uh, how, how the city is, is constructed. Um, you probably know uh, uh, from uh, reading of uh, 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 holy texts, I, I think e even a casual reading uh, will surface uh, enough negative uh, uh, depictions of, uh, uh, of cities and they are littered and, and scattered all through all of these uh, 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 sacred texts. So uh, uh, a fitting title you know, could have been for this talk is religion anti-urban. There is such a strong uh, kind of trope of uh, cities as places of sinfulness, transgression, disobedience of the divine, uh, uh, wrongdoing, uh, uh, etc. But sort of as I read along, the more nuanced and positive picture emerged. So I hope I can I can uh, uh, share that with you, share that with you as well. But before I get to sacred texts, I want to hear. Uh, uh, um, uh, I think two other kinds of sources on religion and the uh, uh, city imaginary need to be heard from. One, of course, is uh, uh, what about oral, non-written spiritual traditions? And you can imagine I'm thinking in particular of uh, Aboriginal spirituality. Uh, how does it uh, uh, address the urban? Uh, this could be the subject of many lectures in its own right, and I'm just going to very, very in, in summary form, uh, give you uh, my sense that uh, of course, Aboriginal spirituality is anchored in human relationship to the natural environment and to all living things, where Abrahamic religions emphasize devotion to the architect of creation, God or Allah. Aboriginal spirituality calls attention to commitment to the product of creation, the natural world, the natural, and, uh, 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 the natural environment, and all living things in it. Uh, so uh, uh, many, some of you will uh, know the work of Yale Boulanger, a uh, uh, pre professor of uh, Native American studies at the University of Le Lethbridge. He puts it this way in an extended uh, 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 quote. Uh, land in the Aboriginal case is the heart of creation. Indigenous scholars tend to present, he says, the land as the heart of creation, a realm where humans are one among a vast array of creatures. Simply put, the earth is the source of native identity, the mother to all children who were assigned responsibilities to act as stewards for creation. This could suggest an Aboriginal valorization of the natural over the built environment. And undoubtedly, many Aboriginals may well have such a personal preference and may feel that natural ground is more sacred and meaningful than paved ground. But 
It's also the case today that over half of all Aboriginals in Canada are now urban. And uh, Belanger himself notes that Indigenous peoples, in his words, have rejected being defined in diametric opposition to all things urban. It's a really interesting question of how a people who are so steeped in a self-definition around a natural world are going to sustain that critical sense of spiritual uh, 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 connectedness in, an, in, a, in as non-natural a setting as, as many of our uh, cities are. And there's some hope uh, uh, in a statement by David Newhouse, uh, uh, Haudenosaunee or origin professor of Aboriginal studies at Trent University, who has written, my life in the city has not made me less of an Aboriginal person. It has made me a different Aboriginal person. So the impact of urban place and urban space on uh, uh, faith communities and on Aboriginals in particular, I think is, uh, is uh, uh, exceptionally uh, uh, important and um, uh, not uh, at this point uh, the lecture that I can or am prepared to, uh, 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 to, to, uh, to move on to, but I, I, I did want to, at least in this talk, recognize and acknowledge the distinctive uh, stance and starting point of Aboriginal spirituality vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, vis -vis space, natural, and, 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 uh, uh, and man-made. Um, uh, a second source on the city in the religious imagination, of course, uh, is uh, secular scholarship. Ancient cities are, of course, the urban reference point of scripture. Sacred uh, texts are referring to the urban places of their time or reaching back to their understanding or, or uh, uh, oral traditions of uh, earlier times. Um, and, of course, there is a huge scholarly literature connecting the dots between ancient cities and godly beliefs, yearnings, and fears. Uh, for instance, contemporary urban theorist John Short has described cities as religious artifacts that always have reflected and embodied cosmologies. Reflecting on the origin of cities, he notes, the earliest cities were marketplaces and living places, but above all, they were ceremonial sites of religious recollection and cosmic narrative. And there's a really ex interesting extension on that line of thought in the work of Lewis Mumford. Mumford, <laughs> in uh, his classic work, The City in History, reaches back to try to explain and understand how did the first human settlement destination point get determined and established? What first prompted humans to stay in or return to a fixed place? And uh, his answer is two words, cemeteries and shrines. Burial grounds and shrines to the gods became the first sites of permanence, according to Mumford. In felicitous phrasing, Mumford writes, the city of the dead antedates the city of the living. Elaborating, he observes, the first germ of the city, then, is the ceremonial meeting place that serves as the goal for pilgrimage, a site to which family or clan group are drawn back because it concentrates in addition to any natural advantages it may have, certain spiritual or supernatural power, power of higher potency and greater duration, of wider cosmic significance than the ordinary processes of life. If Mumford and Short are to be believed, I think there's a very powerful message about the connection between uh, cities, urban places, and religion going on. Uh, and I think the point that they are trying to draw to our attention is cities came into being because of religion or because of what we now understand to be religion and religious impulses. Cities were the spatial sites and social settings in which human needs uh, 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 that we now uh, understand to be uh, or categorized as religious could be met. Cities provided cosmologies, gods, rituals, and recognized sacred space. Early urban humans sought comfort, purpose, and protection, not from a city state, but from city gods. The earliest cities each had their own gods, believed to be in control of human fate and fortune. And it is really interesting that thousands of years later, we still know the names of some of these gods. It tells us how significant in the art, 
in whatever passed as written form, representation of uh, cultures that uh, uh, ancient uh, uh, cities and human uh, uh, settlements had, uh, they put emphasis on naming and paying tribute to their gods, and so we are now familiar with Marduk in Babylon, the sun god Sin in Ur, Ptah in Memphis, Baal in Canaan, Anu in Assyria, and perhaps most memorably of all, uh, Athena in Athens, and Shalom after whom the city of Jerusalem derives its name. Central to every ancient city, of course, was their site of worship and devotion also. So we could have had walking tours of all of these ancient cities and we would have seen uh, these massively significant places of uh, 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 worship, devotion, acknowledgement of the divine, whether temples, ziggurats, or, or shrines. Uh, and for all of their spiritual significance, however, cities, of course, had material preconditions. They required complex divisions of labor and goods exchange in, to assure that non-agricultural city dwellers could be fed. Enter strongman political systems, and most of them, of course, were male-led by kings, uh, uh, um, organizing society through harshly unequal social relations. Slavery was, was common uh, uh, as the socio-political foundation of early cities. Mary Mills, uh, who has done some very interesting writing on the Bible in its time and place, and I'll say, if, I'll draw a few things from her work. Mary Mills writes of the palace temple nexus of ancient cities uh, being critical to biblical cities, and that phrase palace temple nexus kind of echoes to the military industrial complex. Uh, that th those are our iconic institutions of uh, society. Back in ancient cities, it was the palace and the temple. Several scholars note that ancient religions were not, that, that uh, religion in ancient cities was not materially neutral, but that it actively reinforced the political and social inequalities that characterized ancient cities. Religion was put to a purpose in terms of validating and legitimizing existing social relationships. Again, here's John Short on ancient cities saying, urban cosmologies justified the social hierarchy. The cities gave substance to the line of descent from the gods to ruling classes to the masses. That was the, that was the hierarchy of authority and why various strata of authority should be obeyed, the gods the ruling uh, uh, classes and, and positions of the city, and then finally the broad population. The social hierarchy was sanctified and legitimized through the built form of the city, John Short says, and its urban rituals. Spectacular festivals and ceremonies united the people and the rulers and their gods in unchallenged acceptance of the city that was. You can almost hear Karl Marx saying, I told you religion was the opiate of the masses. And interestingly, the impact of religion on prevailing urban socio-political power relations continues uh, in the field of contemporary post-secular city scholarship. One of the main motifs and lines of interest in post-secular city scholarship is the role that uh, uh, religion plays in either uh, challenging or reinforcing existing uh, social relations and social structures, uh, 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 social structures in the city, whether religion acts to resist or reinforce prevailing socio, uh, socio-political power relations is a recurring theme in the study of religion and the city. So, having heard, for, uh, having touched base with, with uh, very quickly with Aboriginal spirituality, having had a sense from secular uh, uh, academic uh, uh, scholarship of the the critical place that religion played in the foundation and operation of early cities. Let me turn finally to an examination of those sacred texts that I promised and their depiction of cities. Uh, I will focus primarily on uh, uh, Jewish scriptures and within that even primarily on the Torah, the five books, uh, the five books of Moses, to some degree the books of the prophets as well, but mostly uh, 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 the five books of uh, of Moses' part of what, of course, in Christian terminology is the Old Testament. Um, uh, I concentrate on the Jewish scriptures for a variety of reasons that, I, that uh, 
uh, one of them is the narrative quality of, uh, of, of the Torah is, is attempting to tell a story of the history and evolution of humans and human society since the divine creation of humans. It is surveying a period of an extensively long period of time, and it is inevitably, in some, in some respects, looking at narratives of changing forms and modalities of human life, including urbanization, urbanization of population. So I think in some respects, I was struck by uh, the Torah compared with uh, uh, the New Testament, compared with the, um, with the Quran, uh, having more material that I could initially readily connect to, to my area of interest. Secondly, of course, uh, uh, the Hebrew scriptures are, are uh, incorporated and a key element within both Christianity and Islam, and so constitute foundational assumptions of those, of those religions as well. Um, dealing with the Bible is tricky. The uh, uh, first thing that, that, that I think you have to come to terms with is who, who, whose work do you think you are reading here? Who's the author of this? Um, now, uh, uh, within each of the Abrahamic traditions, inside each of them, there is a range of responses to that question. Who wrote this? Who, who wrote this work? In each tradition, you will find a range that uh, I think runs as follows. At one point on the continuum is the belief that every word written in holy text is the word of the divine, and we are reading the words of the divine. Elsewhere on the continuum in each of these faiths is the belief that we are reading human written texts that bring to us the, their attempt to encounter a divine and to have a divine presence in their life. Um, I will say for the record that uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, matter I align myself with uh, <clears throat> Uh, Gunter Plaut, who uh, edited uh, one significant uh, version of the Torah, who has written, the Torah is a book which had its origins in the hearts and minds of the Jewish people. The Torah is ancient Israel's distinctive record of its search for God. God is not the author of the text, the people are, but God's voice may be heard through theirs if we listen with open minds. In this vein, the Torah or Old Testament can be regarded as a constructivist text in which humans are expressing their deepest cosmic and everyday inspirations, fears, needs, and desires. And where do cities fit into all of this? Well, let us see, and I'll try to move this along. For starters, uh, let's situ let, me, uh, uh, let me situate uh, time and place of uh, uh, the Torah. Uh, some biblical scholars regard the text very much as a product of its specific location and epoch. Um, thus, Ellen Davis declares, certainly the scriptures of ancient Israel know where they come from. They reflect the narrow and precariously balanced ecological niche that is the hill country of ancient Judah and Samaria. Davis's book, Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture, an agrarian reading of the Bible, situates the Torah's text in the, dis in the distinctly arid soil, challenging crop rearing conditions of a largely agrarian society, desperately in search of inspiration and techniques for sustaining food security. Davis notes, this text could not have been written beside the irrigation canals of Babylon, the perennially flooded Nile, nor the vast fertile plains of North America. So in reading Torah, we are uh, gleaning a precarious anxiety to pastoral herding and, agri and agrarian view of life in cities. As for its timing, most biblical scholars identify uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Torah, which is part of Hebrew scripture, it's not all of Hebrew scripture, but the Torah uh, uh, element of the five books of Moses uh, are uh, by most biblical scholars regarded as a composite body of writing by various authors, 
over a period that stretched roughly 1,000 years from 1400 before the Common Era to 450 before the Common Era. This timeline stretches from the Israelite exodus from Egypt to their exile from Jerusalem to Babylon after the destruction of the first temple. This is a long, long stretch of time over which biblical lands will become increasingly urbanized themselves. City populations, for instance, in Jerusalem, will grow dramatically over this millennium. So here's a spoiler alert of what's coming. The growth of city populations may explain why the depiction of cities in this text changes, it becomes more favorable as these texts are increasingly written in cities from an urban perspective. So I think we will encounter an arc or an evolution in the representation of cities in sacred texts. Okay, here we go. In the early sections of the Torah, uh, uh, there is a recurring negativity towards cities. Indeed, uh, it prompts Rabbi Plout to speak of the anti-urban tradition of the Bible. Cities are often depicted as places of depravity, sin, transgression, defiance. Indeed, so deficient is the urban that, as we will see, its redemption when it comes will signal the arrival of messianic fulfillment. That's a convoluted way of me saying I was really struck by Christian revelation. We will know that the divine has returned when cities become perfect. They're so bad now that the only way we'll know it's really happened is when we have perfectable, perfectable cities and more of that, more of that to come, more of that. That's how bad cities are. They, they will be the benchmark as the Messiah, as the Messiah returned uh, and uh, uh, God returned. Um, uh, so let's, let's see then how scriptures play with a narrative arc that Mary Mills calls the twofold view of the city as corrupt and as perfect. For starters, uh, I think it's certainly uh, uh, telling that the creation narrative in the opening verses of Genesis identifies many elements of the physical world created by God. But cities are not on the list. Uh, of the things that God did in his first six days of labor, uh, the divine did not create a city. Uh, this is, by the way, the, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's that reading of, of the opening uh, uh, verses of, of Genesis, I think, that inspired uh, the 18th century evangelical poet William Cooper to write uh, um, uh, the phrase, God made the country and man made the town. Uh, so we've got a pretty uh, uh, significant distinction here of uh, uh, what is divine and, and, um, and what is perhaps profane uh, uh, and, and who created what here. The implication being that while earth and nature uh, express the divine, cities are distinctly uh, human creations. Uh, 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 a place Ari uh, Molendick has written, often regarded as a danger to true faith. So, as if to confirm the ur that urban sites should be regarded as suspect, we are then informed early in Genesis that the founder of the world's first city was the first recorded murderer among humans. So, who gets brought on stage to create the first city? Uh, uh, it's the first murderer we encounter in, in, in sacred text. Uh, and that, of course, is Cain. Uh, this is no accident of narrative, in according to, and I'll cite here um, another rabbi, uh, Mordecai Kaplan, who noted, to the ancient way of thinking, nothing seemed more natural than to represent a murderer and outlaw as the first builder of cities. The complexity, the turmoil, and the degeneration which marked human life, he says, in the larger centers of population were to them proof that the city had sinister origins. Within a few more chapters of Genesis, city dwellers have gotten so out of hand that God feels compelled to intervene directly. I'm referring here to the story of the Tower of Babel, occasioned by the residents declaring, let us build us a city and a tower with its top in the sky to make a name for ourselves. This is the aspiration of the people of Babylon. Here we have the hubris and overreach of humans reaching, the heavenly sky, reaching for heavenly skies and the domain of the divine. This prompts God's first 
but not last, urban visit. There are scattered references in, the to in, 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 in scripture to God paying visits to cities. This is the first time, this is the first time it arises. Uh, 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 scripture reads, the Lord came down uh, to look at the city and tower which man had built. And God confounds their plans, of course, by introducing many languages among the people and scattering the city's residents over the face of the whole earth. So Babel is the first, though certainly not last, city uh, to brand itself through, or attempt to brand itself, uh, uh, through an iconic building or structure. And uh, there may be a kind of uh, uh, current echo of that. Uh, it may be that the closest thing to city gods these days are the star architects, uh, the handful of architects whose uh, uh, building of iconic structures, uh, Toronto's had its share, uh, uh, Bilbao had its lovely share, and many other uh, cities have, have uh, uh, played the My Tower is Better Than Marie Tower uh, uh, contest. Uh, there is something evocative of, of, uh, 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 and, 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 re and recurrent in cities wanting to brand and identify themselves in this fashion. Uh, the message from sacred texts, we will see, however, is that a city's stature is to rest not on its physical structures, not on its buildings, but on one of two things. It's faith in a single divine and the social relations that are conducted among residents living in the same city. So there is a commitment, devotion to a single divine that runs through a, a scripture, and we'll see, but also a kind of, um, I'll use modern language, social justice uh, 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 um, calling to uh, for cities to be places that uh, uh, care and commit to those uh, of lesser uh, of lesser uh, um, standing and, and uh, capacity in, in, in cities. Uh, Babel's punishment for its excesses of reach is of course relatively benign, perhaps even beneficial. Uh, we do have the scattering the scattering of peoples. Uh, but beyond Babel, the scriptures provide many examples of harsh retribution against cities that have defied the divine, that have uh, defied the divine through either sinful behavior, worshiping false other gods, or uh, not caring for those in need in their midst. And the first archetypal example of this that we read, of course, is the, uh, um, is the uh, terrible fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and how the narrative transports us to these cities, I think, is telling. We are in the early chapters of Genesis still. Abraham and his nephew Lot are both pastoralists. They are herders, together living nomadic lives, tending their flocks and herds. When, uh, uh, when that arid soil of biblical land can no longer sustain both of them and all of their herds, they agree to go in different directions, hoping both will find nurturing land for their, uh, for their uh, uh, flocks. Abraham continues the nomadic way of life in liminal space between towns and competing kingdoms, we are told, while Lot decides to throw his cast in a more urban direction, the text tells us he settles in the cities of the plain, pitching his tents near Sodom. Maybe he's the first suburbanite. He's, he's pitched his tent outside, just on the outskirts of the city of, uh, of Sodom. Uh, bad choice, uh, uh, since the text tells us in the next sentence that the inhabitants of Sodom uh, were very wicked sinners against the Lord. Uh, uh, that is the text we're reading. Their outrages are great, sin so grave. The text goes on to say, death and destruction of the city will be their punishment. So interestingly, the text's warning of dire retribution against sin is conveyed through lots settling in a city, not Abraham's continued pastoral wandering. The pastoral area is presumably has not transgressed. It's the urban realm where transgression has and will occur. There's that uh, remarkable exchange between Abraham and uh, the divine, uh, almost negotiating over uh, whether uh, the entirety uh, population of those two cities is to be destroyed or whether any are to be spared and how many are to be spared. But interestingly, uh, the text does not enumerate what the sins of Sodom are. 
The closest we get are inferences to be drawn from why Lot is deemed to be the only innocent in Sodom, the only resident in that city to be spared along with his family. Lot has shown hospitality, care, and protection to the Lord's emissaries sent to destroy the city. When they, those emissaries, uh, 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 in pretty horrific terms, are threatened uh, uh, with sexual assault by a mob of all the town's men, Lot counters that the visiting men be left alone, and his rationale for why they should be left in peace is, since they have come under the shelter of my roof. It's because I am their host that you must not inflict any uh, uh, pain or hurt to them. Care for the well-being of others, especially the stranger, will be a frequently urged and valorized uh, 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 behavior in the Torah and in other scriptures of Christian and Islamic traditions. Indeed, the prophet Ezekiel describes, and this is from the book of Ezekiel, describes the sins of Sodom as relating not to transgressions against God, but rather to how the city and its residents neglected people in their own midst. The city's faults are identified by Ezekiel as pride, fullness of bread, and not uh, 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 and neither did she, namely the city, strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. So they're rich and they're not charity. And they were haughty. These are the sins, uh, presumably, for which cities and their populations will be destroyed. Cities will be judged. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah tells us on their practice of compassion and social justice. Ellen Davis draws biblical implication beyond these two particular cities by observing prophetic judgment on any given city is rendered on the basis of how it treats those under its domination. Righteousness and justice are fulfilled when those who have some choice about how power is exercised remember those who have little or no choice. Interestingly, it's Lot, isn't it interesting, the only person who gets spared is the person who recently came from the countryside and recently settled on the outskirts of the town. And I think what we're, uh, 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 what it, what, what we're uh, uh, kind of led, led to assume there is he still had enough of the country in him that he had the spirit of hospitality. The longtime city dwellers, they were a lost cause. Uh, uh, there was not that sense of, uh, that similar sense of social, uh, uh, social commitment and uh, uh, um, respo uh, responsibility. Um, and uh, through a constructivist lens, again, readers of this story in the second millennium would have recognized what I just said, that this is a commendation of the countryside over the city. It goes to show how much more valorized and godly the countryside is to the built urban form. Uh, Lot still had enough of his wilderness in him to, to perform just this justice. Uh, this then led me, and this was quite interesting, to segue to something called the Bedouin Hospitality website. There is such a thing, the Bedouin uh, Hospitality website. Um, and uh, what you see on that website is commitment and uh, 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 um, voicing of this uh, herder nomadic responsibility and devotion to hospitality as being core to their culture and values. Uh, uh, I'll just cite you a bit of it. Uh, hospitality uh, 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 in, in, in uh, the Bedouin language, referred to as the Afa, is the highest Bedouin virtue, we are told. It is a matter of honor and also a sacred duty. They then go on for paragraphs, which I won't read, to explain why it is that a pastoral, wandering, nomadic life has as a precondition for survival of individuals and the group a code of, and when you see another person who is a stranger in that foreboding physical environment, 
you show hospitality to them because, of course, the time may not be far off when you are the person in need of such, in need of such hospitality. So the story of Sodom and Gomorrah was a cautionary message to biblical peoples not to forsake those kinds of values. Moving forward, sacred texts, and I, and I am getting to some, some kind of uh, uh, pulling things together. Moving forward, sacred texts then go on to provide many examples. Today we would call them best practices in how cities may be righteous and just. So that if you are looking at sacred text uh, for a kind of consultant's how-to guide, uh, what would an honorable city look like uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, scripture, uh, it would have uh, uh, at least the following five characteristics. Uh, one comes back to the issue of uh, uh, food security, which of course was uh, so critical uh, to these uh, cities, preventing starvation. Given uh, uh, climatic conditions, given uh, uh, topography conditions, given inequalities of social uh, 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 circumstances and arrangements, uh, 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 hunger, starvation, death uh, 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 were, were a constant uh, risk and threat. In a variety of ways, scripture advocates planning and sharing as the best hedges against food deprivation. In Genesis, when seven years of plenty and seven years of famine are foretold, Joseph establishes a plan to store grain for the good years in designated cities, quote, so that the land may not perish in the famine. The people may not, uh, uh, won't, won't, pay, uh, won't perish in the famine. Uh, one way to look at this is these are the world's first food banks, uh, a storage of food for a time when there will not be uh, 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 when there will not be food or when food will not be available. Scripture contains repeated injunctions to share food with the hungry and needy. None are more thundering, of course, than the prophet Isaiah declaring to the people of Jerusalem that God's expectation of humans is, quote, to unlock fetters of wickedness and untie the cords of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break off every yoke. It is to share your bread with the hungry and to take the wretched poor into your home. Uh, uh, it's from this textual ground that so much of the interfaith, uh, multi-faith, social justice work in cities uh, across the world goes on. I'm sure uh, this is uh, manifested here in Victoria as it is in, in cities across the country. Further in Deuteronomy is the injunction that all must leave tithes at the city gates so that the stranger, orphan, and widow who are within your city gates will come and eat their fill. Wealth redistribution and food security are biblical signs of a just, godly city. Second, text tells us that in addition to social justice, the city should be a place of legal justice. In Deuteronomy, the Israelites are told to appoint fair, impartial judges immune to bribery and corruption. And the words, of course, ring out, justice, justice, shall you pursue. This is an important calling to ensure that cities are not unduly swayed by economic elites, social status, or military might, but that law and justice is uh, apportioned equally to all urban residents. Third, the scripture ascribes an, uh, uh, an intriguing role to some cities in the area of criminal justice. This is the provision calling for cities of refuge to be established. There are recurring places in the Bible where references are made to cities of refuge. Uh, in the book of Numbers and again in Deuteronomy, the Israelites are told to establish cities of refuge as havens for those who have unintentionally killed another person. Those seeking retribution uh, against an inadvertent killer, therefore, uh, could not harm a person if they were in a city of refuge. The text explicitly states that haven should be provided not only to Israelites, but to, quote, this is the text language, resident aliens as well. In other words, this is a universal protection to be accorded all persons who have inadvertently, accidentally committed homicide. The idea, of course, is to recognize the distinction between intentional and unintentional murder and to limit the cycle of retribution and killing 
uh, uh, to the former, to, 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 intentional, uh, uh, to intentional murders. And there are all kinds of provisions, interesting uh, 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 they are, about uh, how uh, those who are claiming that they, were, uh, that, that they should be uh, uh, given asylum in a city of refuge, that their uh, deed was in fact uh, um, unintentional, how that should be adjudicated, that determination. But uh, it was very striking, of course, that there are echoes in this concept of cities of refuge to the current significant phenomenon of sanctuary cities across North, across North America. These are cities uh, uh, that typically have passed a local council uh, 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 declaration that they will provide support to persons not in compliance with official residency requirements of the particular country. There are about 50 cities across North America, Toronto is what is, happens to be one of them in Canada, where the municipal council has voted to declare itself a sanctuary city, meaning that they will undertake to provide a number of supports to those who are, in the American case, called undocumented, in the Canadian case, called non-status. They will be provided all municipal services without being asked what their status is uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in immigration status. Uh, they and their children will have uh, uh, schooling and educational uh, 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 facilities uh, uh, available to them. A number of municipalities also uh, produce ID cards so that people who are uh, uh, non-status can have some kind of official government, uh, government documentation. And uh, uh, in some cities, uh, there are efforts to extend municipal voting rights to all residents, regardless of what their, what their citizenship or immigration status happens to be. The idea being a resident is an urban citizen. Uh, that residency should be, in municipal terms, grounds for belonging and, uh, uh, belonging and, uh, uh, and rights. There are interesting references in the Torah to uh, rules of warfare between cities that certainly, by a long shot, predate the Geneva Convention. Uh, uh, they have some good parts and some bad parts. The good part is, uh, uh, biblically, the injunction is you, you shall not invade another city without giving them warning that you're coming and giving them the option of uh, uh, surrendering. The bad news is that if they don't surrender and after the Lord gives you their, allows you to win the victory, you are of course to slaughter every human uh, person in that city and uh, uh, raise the city to the ground uh, 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 because they have been faithless. They have, they have, they have, not, uh, uh, they have not honored the divine. So you know, all of which is to say, and there are a few more sort of exemplars of this that I could, that I could cite. You know, there is this very difficult, in the end I was left with a very difficult kind of wrestling of uh, there's a duty to, to the divine which has uh, uh, unforgiving uh, uh, qualities to it and, and uh, 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 devastating qualities of it. City cities are not places of pluralism and tolerance and, and uh, recognition of uh, multiplicity of belief systems biblically. They are to be uh, 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 there's one God and that God uh, and that God alone is to be is to be uh, is to be honored and uh, much destruction can be wrought on those who uh, uh, follow false gods. On the other hand, there is a very powerful message here. Uh, about uh, the obligation uh, that uh, city dwellers have to fellow city dwellers. And there's a sense that if city dwellers get their act together and behave in a way that is committed and socially responsible to other city dwellers, that much goodness will come to them. So there is kind of a message here of of uh, uh, social commitment and uh, social uh, uh, and uh, um, social justice. Um, there, uh, uh, I think I will um, I will end uh, by saying, uh, uh, you know, incredibly powerful is uh, um, uh, the the imagery around the New Jerusalem and, and, and the New Jerusalem being when we will know and how we will know that uh, uh, the divine uh, 
uh, will has been served and that uh, godliness has been restored to earth and that God, God in Revelation, will, will return and become an urban resident in Jerusalem. Uh, for the eternity of, of times and days, uh, uh, there will be no nights, there will never be darkness, there will only be light. The divine will live, will live in the new Jerusalem. And uh, uh, I don't need to tell um, um, an audience in um, Vancouver Island uh, how powerful and important uh, the notion of the New Jerusalem has been uh, in Canadian politics uh, for much of the 20th century, uh, the social gospel in particular, uh, the career of uh, Tommy Douglas. Um, it is interesting, the major biography of Tommy Douglas is titled Tommy Douglas, The Road to Jerusalem. Uh, the road ran just a little bit up the street in, in the riding of uh, um, Nanaimo, Cowich, and the Islands that Tommy Douglas uh, uh, represented for the last decade or so of his political career. Um, so from, um, from creation to uh, Vancouver Island, uh, there is a thread here about uh, the place that cities occupy in uh, notions of uh, the divine and in the uh, religious imagination. Thank you very much. I think we only have one mic. We do have about 15 minutes or so for some conversation. Oh, we have another one. Okay. Uh, so who would like to ask the first question? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I didn't know we had the mics for our questions. Well, so, the, so that for, for posterity. Uh, I enjoyed that talk a lot. I, mean, I was thinking about a variety of things. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to throw a few things out, I think, but I'll come to the, the final thing that, that uh, towards the end of, end of your talk uh, I was thinking. Uh, but earlier I had been thinking first, uh, whether there's work on and whether you have an interest in um, rather than textual ongoing religious interpretations of the city um, your discussion of indigenous spirituality uh, reminded me there was a talk by Victoria Freeman I think it's connected with the University of Toronto where she had uh, some material um, on um, indigenous interpretations of skyscrapers and the kind of spirituality of skyscrapers and I wonder whether that kind of analysis can be pulled out elsewhere uh, and, and developed within that context. Um, the second thought I had was uh, about the Talmud. Uh, so now you start to get interpreters of Torah whose authority derives in part from central locations, and I wonder whether the Talmud, whether you can stretch this analysis into Talmud and whether you get a more pro-urban, um, a number of the topics that you touched on are extensively discussed in Talmud, and yeah. so uh, I wonder whether the Talmud gets very pro-urban or not. Right. Um, but then the final thing I was wondering, uh, in your suggestion, I wonder whether the image of the city as a place of inhospitality um, is in fact um, uh, a, a, a kind of, um, that, it, that it might be precisely um, the opposite of, of kind of urban experience of that time. And what we have here is a non-urban religious authority trying to keep its flock away from the city and said, don't go there, that's where they won't receive you, and, but, and, that, and that injunction is motivated precisely by the fact that they would be received in cities, and cities are precisely the places where they're going to stray from um, yeah. adherence, right? So that um, it, it, you're getting a cut, even in the, uh, um, and then maybe some of that anxiety abates in the later yeah. period is more than later. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Jordan, uh, uh, those are really interesting uh, observations and, and dots you've put out there in search of, of uh, connection and, and, and uh, uh, interpretation. And I'm going to give you impressions rather than scholarly based uh, um, <clears throat> based answers. Um, uh, it's interesting. You're you're you're, you're almost. Uh, um, 
your your last comment almost suggests that that we think of of religious uh, texts as messaging to people of where they should or shouldn't live for for their own we're telling them for their own good you don't want to go there because it's not a nice not a nice congenial uh, hospitable place um, I, I I don't know about that I mean cities by then had become already quite large and cities were their own institution you know their own societies with their own demographic imper imp imperatives um, so uh, some of this might come down to was it uh, were, were the writers of these texts uh, rural based or urban based uh, that would be something interesting to try to, to, to you know to try to probe, probe and uh, explore um, I, I don't know the answer to that in terms of uh, you know where uh, where where does biblical scholarship tell us or, or suggest that those those who wrote these texts uh, actually lived? Um, there's another thought on that that has <clears throat> that has escaped me. It, it, it might come back. Uh, oh man, t uh, 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 two months I could barely get through the five books of Moses in my Talmud. <laughs> So I'm afraid that that's a really interesting observation and and and, and something something to look for. Um, you know, there's no question that over you know uh, uh, the prophets then are written from about 500 BCE till about one or two hundred uh, common era. So we're talking about almost a, a 1500 year period just of those two uh, of, of Torah and. And, and, and the prophets, and in that period, cities became large. I mean, if it's to be believed, you know, the Torah tells us, uh, 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 prophets tell us Nineveh was an urban place that took three three days to walk across. Well, that's that's a fairly large urban ur, urban urban space. So cities had become urban places had become quite large by then. Then would needed their own <clears throat> their own. Uh, 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 stream and supply of, uh, of population. So somebody needed to be putting out literature uh, 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 promoting the virtues of the city. Either that, or you were, of course, enslaving populations and dragooning them into uh, dragooning them into cities. You were engaging in warfare. Um, uh, boy, it, yeah, it, it really is interesting. The, 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 uh, uh, your comment about. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, skyscrapers and, and indigenous spirituality. Uh, there is, I guess, just something mesmerizing about a large structure that then gets us thinking that once it has built, it has transported us or our imagination into an otherworldly realm. And we then come to associate that otherworldliness with a sphere of, div of, of, of divinity that, that uh, um, it uh, size matters uh, in, 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 in urban structures, and it does conjure up uh, uh, in really interesting ways uh, the, uh, across different faith, uh, um, across different faiths, that association of, of divine, yeah, association, yeah. Um, other, sorry, other questions. Uh, I'd be open both to, you know, uh, I very much invite questions, but also uh, I'm really curious um, sort of what thoughts from, from uh, scriptural readings that any of you have done, uh, uh, what, what can we learn from uh, and what are the limits to what can be learned from what, what these texts tell us about cities and urban places and urban societies. One of the things we've been talking about a lot at the center is this new religious phenomenon called spiritual and non-religious, this um, sort of modern phenomenon of people who claim to be spiritual and non-religious. And um, so this, this, this comment, this question of yours about what texts we would um, sort of twig on um, comes to mind. Um, people like Eckhart Tolle. Yeah spiritual guru of the spiritual and religious movement. And it seems to me a lot of the rhetoric that turns that is about um, anti-urban sort of nature worship sort of yeah. something going on there. 
So I'm wondering if you want to comment on that and sort of think that through. In light of your comment earlier that um, God and nature are sort of elided together, um, cities are man-created. Yeah. <clears throat> um, <laughs> so th this again takes us back to our stance towards text and faith. Um, you know, that, that <laughs> uh, there are some fighting words in, in, um, in, in scripture that are among the, the fieriest battle cries of social justice commitment that, that you can find almost in any, you know, you, uh, in, in any written, uh, uh, written form. Uh, you know, the, the vigor and, and intensity with which we are called upon in some of these texts to devote ourselves to the well-being of fellow residents in, in, in urban places. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways what I personally take from this is uh, if, if I'm not going to see these texts as divinely written. That's the first choice I have to make. Are they the word of a divine? And if they are, that poses a certain stance of, of, of orientation to them. Once you, de once you decide they are not uh, uh, um, the, the words of a divine, but are, are a human record of an attempted encounter with something larger and more powerful than demons, then that gives the reader the latitude, I think, to take uh, messages from the text and to see them as the, the calling to us from our faith tradition, from our faith community. And it gives legitimacy to a certain stance that we might otherwise have, that we don't need religion for, but it sure is convenient that you can find in religious texts if 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 you if you're you know, if you come to this from a stance of, of uh, a social justice positioning, uh, 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 it is important and really helpful that those words and, and recur in 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 text, uh, and that it's possible for us to then create the religious tradition that we think is meaningful for us in our cities today. And a lot of what's hopeful that's going on is the amount of interfaith work that goes on across, across denominations and across faith traditions, Abrahamic and, and well beyond, uh, uh, I, I think is an attempt by people from various faith communities to act in a way that they understand to be godly. That, there, that, that there's a potential for this for taking human to human relationships and making that responsibility of a, of a higher calling than just uh, it's so important we are called to do it by more than just our own human voice and psyches but by more something more powerful that we, we think of as a divine presence so, Meyer, we have uh, time for one punchy question. Yes. Well, well, I was just going to say, in, in your earlier part of the issues facing the city, uh, you, you might include one about city space and cyberspace. Because mm -hmm. on the CBC National today, they announced that uh, internationally now, uh, the city of Toronto was identified more with Rob Ford than the, the CN Tower. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was going to pick up on your question, and uh, in the Gospels, there could be a case made for saying that that theme about rural and city is played out with Jesus actually as the rural person from the yeah. back hills and all of his life and his ministries there except for a few short days in the holy city and in the holy city uh, he weeps over that city right he's rejected by the city and he's crucified outside the city walls so uh, your themes, as you looked yeah. earlier, I think could be quite interesting to look at how they are picked up again, yeah. perhaps, in, in the Gospels as well. That, that, that's really interesting. Yeah. Final, final comment. Um, okay, I can't resist. Uh, um, uh, so it, uh, the only other time I've heard Rob Ford and uh, 
Jesus Christ, and countryside, <laughs> and countryside, and downtown, all put together, was by a, 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 a colleague at, U, a, at, U, at U of T, and I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do in Victoria. He said, oh yeah, th th tell him it's just like Rob Ford. It's like, it's like Jesus Christ went from the suburbs, where he was born, to downtown, <laughs> and the downtown elites really didn't like him, so they crucified him. And Rob Ford tells us that's what's going on with him. <laughs> um, Let's not end with Rob Ford. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. So I was just kidding at the beginning. Okay, so there, there, there are a lot of odd echoes uh, in scripture, in faith traditions, and, and the world we are now we now find ourselves in, and uh, uh, you give, uh, this has given me a lot to uh, um, to think about and try to perhaps put put in a clearer kind of motif. But I have very very much appreciated this opportunity to be with you and uh, uh, to, to share some of this thinking. Thank you, Mark. So uh, really appreciate you coming up, Lucano, to share your thoughts with us. Um, if you are not on the City Talks mailing list uh, or on the CSRS mailing list, I'm going to leave this up here, put your name on there, we'll make sure that you get um, into the loop so you're aware of the scheduling and the topics for the, the Security in the City series, which begins in January, and so that you're reminded of the final Religion in the City talk, which is in April. So, uh, thank you everybody, uh, you can go out into the extreme, extreme weather, I hope you all make it home, uh, and uh, enjoy the weekend everybody, take care. Thank mm -hmm. you.